dive in. After years of working in these large companies with really senior and important roles, mm -hmm. why did you decide to go off and start your own venture? Yeah. Uh, well, I think I always had that entrepreneurial mind. I think we talked about this mindset or spirit. I don't know, maybe I was talking to somebody else about this. But I think, you know, even working in large corporations, I always felt I was entrepreneurial. And um, I had spent most of my adult life in Manhattan, moved to Los Angeles about 11 years ago, and we bought a house. I know it sounds like it's a big deal, buying a house, but I realized it was the first time I'd actually lived in a house since I left to go to Stanford. And I became somewhat of a lunatic about designing and entertaining and became so obsessed with it that, like, I think a lot of, um, you know, businesses, I was looking for something and I couldn't find it. And I was looking to find unique product for my house online. And this was back in 2007. Uh, and it was pretty dismal as far as, you know, interesting, unique products. There were, you know, Amazon was there. So, like, if you knew that, you know, if you knew what you wanted, you could just type it in and find it. But if you were sort of on a journey looking for interesting and unique products, it just it didn't exist out there. And so... I was, I thought, hmm, there seems to be a big white space there. Now the question was how to go about, you know, what to do about it. And so that was really the beginning thinking about One King's Lane. So what was the vision for the company and the product and yeah. the service for One King's Lane? Yeah, so I think the vision was really, and it, it remains the same today, is really to inspire people and help them really create the homes that they love through uh, you know, bringing together a collection of really unique and interesting products that they might not otherwise be able to find and get access to. And was there anything else like this in the marketplace at the time? No, there was, there is, there is literally nothing out there. I mean, there was, like I said, there was Amazon, and then, you know, your, your big box retailers, so Restoration Hardware, Crate and Barrel, Pottery Barn, Head websites. But actually, many of the manufacturers that we went to to try to work with, they didn't even have, I know this sounds so crazy, they didn't even have their own corporate websites back then. So it was actually, you know, quite interesting trying to talk somebody into giving us their merchandise to sell online when they didn't even have their own websites online. They, you know, were a little bit behind the times, this, this industry, when it came to online. So before we dive into exactly what the company did and the strategy, I know you started this with a partner, with Alison Pincus. Yeah. How did you meet her? Okay, so, well, this is a kind of a, a unique... I think there's a lot of things that are actually unique about how we actually started this business and, uh, you know, actually got going and started. But I, my background, as you had mentioned, was in retailing and merchandising. So I felt we were really covered on that end. But I really didn't know very much about digital uh, marketing and things like that. So I felt... I would be, it would be great if I could find a partner to do this with that would really complement, you know, what I had, in you know, my skill set. Um, and my husband actually met a, a woman, another uh, female entrepreneur, and said, you know, my wife's got this idea. What do you think about it? And she said, I think it's a really great idea. I'd like to talk to her. So I spoke to her. This is... Um, uh, Lisa Stone from Blog Her, I don't know if you know, a big blog. And she said, well, what can I do to help? And I said, well, if you know anybody that would be interested in this venture and partnering with me that has digital marketing background, I'd love to meet them. So she said, you know, I actually think I know somebody, but let me check with them and get back to you. And literally the next day, Lisa Stone sent an email introducing me to Allie, um, you know, and said, have fun, like go at it, hope it works out type of thing. And that was it. She disappeared. So Allie and I started emailing and talking on the phone because I lived in Los Angeles and Allie actually lived in San Francisco. So we were a little bit geographically undesirable <laughs> as far as where we were living. Um, and I finally said to Allie like three weeks into this, hey, if you know, you're really interested in this, you need to get on a plane and come to Los Angeles so that we can you know, really talk about this. I need to meet you. I still hadn't met her yet. Um, and she said, I'm coming tomorrow. So she, you know, flew down. I had to go to Google and look up what she looked like because I said I'd pick her up at the had airport. Had you already decided that you were going to partner? No, no, no. Okay. We, they, okay. We're still in the, the dating, dating date. Stage. We're okay. still dating, okay. for sure. And um, so I pick her up. We spent the day together. You know, everything was going great. And we kept talking and, you know, trying to think about strategy and how we'd go about doing this. And three weeks later, you know, I finally said to her, listen, you know, are you interested in this? You know, if yes, great. If not, cool. Then I'm moving on. 
And she said, no, I want to do this. And so uh, we decided to, to form a partnership. And uh, you know, it was the height of the recession, because this was in November 2008. Uh, I think all the the uh, VCs were hiding under their desks at the time, so we didn't we didn't even try to you know go out and raise money. So we decided that we would both you know contribute equal amounts to the business, and we boot, we bootstrapped it. Okay, but I want to back up. So you basically dated your partner for three weeks exactly before well, decided it was six. It okay, ended up being six weeks. Six, yeah. Okay, six weeks, and then you <laughs> decided to work together. How did you structure that partnership? Because that's often a really interesting discussion yeah. about. You know who has more equity. Right. You know, I mean, you you had some background in in, in business. You had yeah. had an MBA. And she so knew Alex. something so about um, about starting ventures. So, how did you actually structure yeah. the the partnership? Um, you know, it's kind of remarkable because it just wasn't that complicated, and I think that was part of what made it work. And you know. Uh, enabled us to to really get going and move very quickly. We just did not complicate it. We said we're each putting in the exact same amount of money. The expectation is we each would work just as hard as the other one. Um, and so it was a 50-50 uh, deal. Okay, great. And that worked out. And it was it was it was all good. Good, perfect. Because we yeah. often hear stories where that ends up not being yeah. a good decision. But it sounds like that yeah, worked out. I mean, you know, listen we could have sat around and talked like, you know, it's my idea, I could take more, you should take less, but it just felt like we knew what was in front of us, it was a lot to get done, uh -huh. and it just felt like we're going to do this, we're going to do this together, let's start off on equal footing and, and go at it, and, and I think that was, that, it, that made a big difference. Okay, so tell us about the early days and what you did first. Um, yeah. Sounds like you bootstrapped it, right? We, we you didn't, boot, you didn't raise any money. No money. You mm -hmm. basically put your own funds in. Yep. And what did you do first to build this venture? So I think, you know, what we realized is that, um, and I should just also say that when we started off, the idea was actually to do this as a flash sale. So I don't know if everyone's familiar with that model, but flash sales really came sort of on the scene in 2007 in the fashion business. And basically this was almost like a sample sale brought online. So every day was a different day at a flash sale. Every day you would, you know, log on and there would be different things for sale there and there would only be there would be limited inventory for a limited amount of time. So that was actually our our, our so, idea was to do take home and do it in this model. So it was scarcity, right? It I was could go definitely on scarcity. and there were only this many throw pillows this day. Exactly. Scarcity. Also, you never knew what you were going to find. So it was a little bit of a gaming, you know, gaming aspect to it, which made it sort of fun. Um, and the one thing that we did, which hadn't really been done, is that we really uh, curated what we were doing. Like it's a word that's really overused today, but back in 2008, 2009, when we were doing this, there, there, the, what, there were no websites like this, you know. So what we actually did and brought to market was kind of interesting because when you came on our site, it was inspirational and it was beautiful, but you knew you had to get in there and shop. And you know, if you wanted something, react quickly. The business has now evolved, and we can talk about that. But that's what it was when we started. So what we knew was there was a bunch of things we had to do. One, we had to find. Uh, customers because it was an email based mm -hmm. model. So if we were, once we started, we needed to have a group of people to email to to tell them what we were, you know, going to sell. Mm -hmm. So we developed a plan around how we could, um, you know, build a c customer base, and our goal was to get 5,000 people signed up prior to the launch. Um, and we did this by. Uh, because there was nothing to see, which is really hard to get people to sign up. You know, it was just like a splash page. But we told everybody that if you signed up prior to us going live, you would automatically be entered to win an Hermes throw, which we felt would resonate with this consumer. Um, it would hurt us in the pockets because I had to go buy a $1,200 <laughs> throw when somebody actually won it. But it, we got 5,000 people. We actually, weirdly enough, this is another funny story, the day we launched, 8 o'clock that morning, the email went out. Uh, our developer called me and he said, this is really strange. I know your goal was 5,000 people. You have exactly 5,000 people signed up right now. I'm like, send that email right, that, right wow, this second. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's just, you know, it was coincidence, but wow. it was kind of crazy. So we had to get people signed up, so we did that, and we used an ambassador program also to make that happen. 
We had to get manufacturers to sign up. We felt like that was, if we could get a month's worth of what we called sale events, then we would be fine because we felt that there would be enough momentum that once other vendors saw somebody else on there that they would be willing to work with us. Did you have inventory or did you just no, essentially a, no, make the, these deals and did they have to essentially? Yeah, so the model was basically uh, the vendor would hold the inventory. We'd negotiate what, what items we wanted to sell on the site and they would hold the inventory for three days while the sale ran and then if we sold it then they would get a purchase order. So it's kind of like I would call a new age consignment model. So that was also, you know, part of the beauty and why we were able to do it and bootstrap it because there was no inventory costs. So, Very cool. Yeah. So what tell us about the early successes. You know, how did you you know, what sort of data did you look at to see whether this was actually gaining traction? Yeah, I mean, the, the, what we looked at a couple different things. I mean, one was membership. So we started with 5,000 on day one. On day two, we had 25,000 people. Um, that was based on a PR strategy that we did, which was we gave an exclusive to a company that was out there that had a daily newsletter at the time called Daily Candy. They're no longer around, but um, by giving them the exclusive to One Kings Lane, the next day we went from five to 25,000, and the, so we were measuring the growth of our membership, so, and that was growing really pretty much exponentially, so that was one measurement, obviously revenue. Um, and we were experiencing the same thing on revenue. So we first day, I think we did $1,600. The second day, we did $32,000. By month four, we were doing a million dollars. The first nine months, we did $6 million. So, you know, revenue. And, and let me ask you, but what about net? Did you actually make money on these yeah, sales? And I so, mean, was this yeah, profitable? Yeah, and so actually, that was kind of the amazing thing. We were cash flow positive and making money So in those first uh, six months. So... Uh, this is fascinating. You then decided to go out and get venture capital funding. Right. Why? Why did you not just decide to keep this a private business yeah. and just keep growing it based on, you know, reinvesting the profits? Yeah. So it, it's a very <coughs> tough decision. I mean, when I say that we were cash flow positive and, you know, and profitable, we were also incredibly under-resourced. So, you know, literally... We would wait to the end of every month to see how much money we made to see if we could hire like another person. So, you know, at the end of that first uh, six months, I think we were nine people in total, you know, doing all of that. That was kind of crazy. So we knew we needed to do something to, uh, you to know, scale. Yeah, it, to scale the business. Mm -hmm. And it was a really tough decision. I mean, this happened, I'd say about four months into it, we started getting a lot of inbound requests from, you know, the venture community. And, you know, when you start off and it's your own money in the beginning, then, you know, all of a sudden saying, okay, well, I understand the positive. This is going to be smart money coming in and it's going to help us scale. And we think this is now going to be a really big thing. You know, where in the beginning, Allie and I were worried about whether it would work or not. Now we knew it was going to work. And how big could it actually be? Uh, versus, okay, we're going to keep this like a nice lifestyle business mm -hmm. and, you know, go along. It was a lot of conversations about it, you know, and giving up, you know, a percentage of the company to, you know, the investors and things like that. But we ultimately decided we felt we really were on to something big and that, you know, taking the, the money and you know, the investment was the right thing to do to scale the business. So what was your pitch to the investors? What did, you know, what did you tell them? Or did they just come and say, start writing checks? Well, <laughs> Um, no, it wasn't always like that. Actually, you know, it's an interesting thing. We, we talked to, we, we kept it down to, I think, four or five different firms because it's really time consuming to do this when you're running a business. I mean, actually, you know, I, I wonder sometimes if the VCs even, you know, realize like, you know, you're trying to run a business and then you've got to, you know, go meet with them and nobody ever comes to you. Right. So, um, and actually there was one VC that we were really interested in working with and, they gave us a term sheet that we didn't like, so we passed on it. And he called me a couple months later and said, I'm so mad, like, you know, my wife is so mad that I didn't invest in your company. I said, you should have probably talked to her when, uh -huh. when we were meeting, you know, then maybe you would have given us a different term sheet. But, um, no, I mean, the pitch was that, you know, this was something new and different. We were first to market. We really were disrupting an industry, which is really what was starting to happen is that, 
the home furnishings industry, incredibly fragmented, um, kind of a mystery to a lot of people. You know, you sort of had at one end, uh, like I said, Crate and Barrel Pottery Barn where you could go in and get a look and that look might be exactly what your neighbor had. The other end, there was something called To the Trade, which nobody could really kind of figure out. It's where, you know, high-end interior designers have access to merchandise and, you know, uh, people like ourselves wouldn't, you know, be able to sort of figure out how to get there. We really democratized that and gave people access to all of that merchandise, and that hadn't been done before. So when you were growing, what kind of people were you adding? I mean, it sounded as though you went from, you know, four to 500 people over a very short period of time. What yeah. type of people were you adding to your team? Oh, to the team, yeah. Uh, well, for sure, merchants. I mean, you know, one of the things that we had this hyper growth, and one of the things that was you know, a little tricky is that we didn't have systems in place to help us, you know, scale. The technology was not in place. So the only way to continue to perpetuate the growth was almost really to throw bodies at it. So these were merchants. So as we brought on more and more categories, we'd have to add, you know, buyers to, to cover off on, on those categories. Also marketing, uh, you know, we built out a pretty robust marketing team and I think also really important was our creative which really is sort of the hallmark of what One Kings Lane is you know you can go to our site all the imagery that you see there is done internally so we do everything there um, and we started to build a, really a world-class creative organization internally. So let's talk about your relationship with the venture capitalists along the way. Yep. You said they were bringing in smart money. Yep. Was what kind of advice and guidance were they giving you? Were they leading you in the right direction? Did that feel like that was a really terrific contribution to your team? Yeah, I think you know at the, at the time it all it all seemed good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know they had all done this before, so we you know certainly listened to them. You know took direction as far as the type of marketing people as an example, because we were doing very little marketing prior to raising money. So. Um, I actually remember, this is funny, Allie coming to me because she was sort of in charge of that saying, uh, we need to start spending, you know, money on Google AdWords. We need to start buying. And I'm like, well, how much money are you talking about? She goes, I, we need like $10,000 a month. I said, $10,000 a month? That's crazy. That's so much money, which is a joke because I think, you know, once we started to scale our marketing team, we were probably spending that, you know, in a, in, in, well, for sure, less than a day. We were spending a lot of money on internet marketing. So, um, anyway, they, you know, they, they gave us advice about hires. They helped a lot with that. You know, as we started to build out our leadership team, um, and uh, I think that was that was helpful. You know, obviously they're all pretty well connected, and they could, you know, help us sort of source the right people. Uh, so for the I know. Company. So th this is great. I know that oftentimes, especially in those days, there was a lot of emphasis on building, you know, your mailing list and the traffic. Exactly. And, and But I wonder, were you also looking at profit at this point? Because I know at some point, things started turning right. in a different direction. Yeah. And people started looking for different types of metrics of success. So yeah. can you talk about what you were looking at and how that switched? Yeah. Um, we were not looking at profit, actually. We were looking at, you know, a number of people that were, you know, coming to the site that were signing up, obviously revenue again. Um, you know, we, were looking, started, we started to be able to look at the lifetime value of the consumer. And actually there were some numbers that were, you know, pretty uh, impressive. I mean, still to this day, 80% of the revenue every month is generated by repeat customers. So, you know, that, was, um, that meant that we were doing something right for the customer was engaged. Like once we had her, she was, you know, ours and shopped a lot. Um, but yeah, we were not looking at profitability. It was more about how fast can you ramp, how fast can you scale, worry about the profitability will come come later. So that was the advice you were getting from everyone else too, is listen, let's just look at the number of customers. Yeah. At what point did they say, or did you say, hey, guess what? We're losing money on every customer, yeah. but we're going to make it up in volume. Yeah, yeah. Um, i say it was about into mm, fourth or fifth year that, okay. you know, we really started to, to look at, uh, you know, sort of more of the unit economics and also start, like, we were running so fast and adding so many, like, categories, as an example, that we started to look at the categories and, like, did we really need all of those categories? 
was the investment we were making worth the return that we could get out of it. And so, you know, we started really starting to hone in and really examine things a lot closer than we had been. It's, it's pretty challenging to do that when you're experiencing triple digit growth. I mean, you do, you're obviously looking at the numbers, but to really dig down deep because you're just trying to, you know, it's like stay, stay up with it basically. So it sounds like at that some point you made the decision to start focusing on different things and yeah. I understand you ended up starting to cut pieces of the business in order to try to gain profitability. Is right. that true? Yep. Can you tell us about that process? Yeah, I think, uh, well, you know, we were, uh, we were uh, scaling. You talk about like 500 people as an example. The 500 people scaling was really in anticipation of a certain revenue number that, you know, we were going towards. And when we started pulling back on certain things like some marketing levers is an example because you know maybe some of the things that we were doing on Facebook we realized after analysis although we could capture a customer and they would buy something they didn't come back so that was like not a good use of money so when we started pulling back on that it started to you know impact the growth okay so this is all sounds very analytical can you talk a little bit about the emotions that were mm. happening during this time, right? I'm sure that things were flying high as you were growing and growing and growing, yeah. but when you started realizing that you needed to look at things differently, tell us about how you, how you and Allie yeah. felt, what was the decision-making process, what was going on inside? Yeah, I think, well, I think it, it ends up being a pretty big uh, cultural issue because, you know, here we were, you know, very successful, growing, 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 raising lots of money, and then, you know, we make a decision that actually we need to focus on bottom line, we need to get to profitability, how do we do that, which meant cutting back. So now all of a sudden you have to take your entire organization who you've been telling them all along, just do what you need to do to grow this business and make it happen and say, you know what, we're going to change things a little bit and we're going to have to make some changes and we're going to focus on, uh, you know, bottom line and get into profitability. It's, it's a hard thing to do uh, within an organization, especially when from literally from day one you've had nothing but, you know, hyper growth. Gosh, that must have been really tough. Was, How, the, talk was, a little bit about your relationship with the venture capitalists at, at this point. You know, they've now put a lot of money in, mm -hmm. right? Um, first, you had you know a bootstrap business that was running. You're making your own decisions. You get this huge influx of money. You're growing to the moon, and now all of a sudden. Yeah. You've got to start cutting back. What is has that relationship shift? Um, you know what? I have to say, I give I give a lot of credit actually to our investors. They were incredibly supportive. I think everybody, you know, was in this for the same reason, and so I think they did everything that they could to help us. And they didn't really tell us to do this or do that. I think they were made suggestions, and they left it up to you know the CEO to make the you know the ultimate decision of what to do. Like as an example, we did uh, two rounds of layoffs. I think when I think back in hindsight, because it's an amazing thing, you know, we laid off, um, uh, I think the first time 80 something people, we probably should have laid off 160 people. And that was a recommendation that was made, but we felt that the organization was, would really could potentially like fall apart if we did that. And we probably would have been fine, you know, but it just, we never had experienced anything like that. So 80 people seemed so extreme to begin with. The thought of 160 people is like, where would we, you know, where would we even think to take that from? But that was like an example of recommendation that did come from our investors. But they didn't say you have to do that. That was, you know, trying to help move, move us towards that. So let's let's flash forward a little bit. At some point, the decision was then made to sell the company. Yep. That must have been a really interesting emotional place where, right, you, this is your baby, you've seen it growing so well, you've been cutting things back, and now the decision, talk about the decision to actually sell the business. Yeah. I think um, the decision to sell was not as hard as it might you know, seem because I think we built an incredible company, an amazing brand, a brand that, um, you know, to our consumer is they they love it you know they i mean it's it's interesting to go out and talk to our consumer and you know i mean like there's an example like e everyone hates getting a million emails i have people that tell me they look forward to getting the one king's lane email because it's their daily dose of you know inspiration so we built something really special 
um, and uh, unique that didn't exist out there that really resonated with the consumer. And the idea of like wanting to take it to where, you know, really unleash the brand and let it go to where it where we felt it should be and where it could get to, the idea of, you know, an acquisition didn't made sense, you know, yeah. especially somebody like uh, Bed Bath and Beyond that, you know, is rather large and has pretty deep pockets and you know, uh, could understand sort of the potential of what was there. Who negotiated that deal? Was it you? Was it the VCs? How did that, how uh, did that was, negotiation we, go? There, we had a CEO at the time, so the CEO basically did the negotiation. So you brought in a new, another CEO. We had, at what point did that happen? Well, we, had a, we brought in a CEO actually about six months after we did our Series A. Um, and that CEO was with us for four years, and then he left, and then this was the second CEO who negotiated this. Very interesting. So... It would be great for us to now unpack what things you might have done differently, mm. right? I mean, this was an amazing educational experience, right? Yep. You got your MBA, you get another MBA for this. Yeah, this okay. Is definitely. What, okay. <laughs> what lessons can you extract from this experience of going from founding the company, growing it, laying off people, and then uh, yeah. ultimately selling it? Yeah, I mean, you know, there are a lot of good lessons um, to learn. I think we did a lot of things right, you know, in, in doing this. I think, you know, our laser, we were laser focused on our brand. And I think because of our brand, we were able to build a really strong consumer base. Um, I think that was important. I think we did things, uh, we tried to keep very focused and keep things simple, which is kind of hard to do in today's world. I think that was a good thing. We were very, we're very, and remain very consumer focused. That was all good. I think, you know, going back to this whole profitability thing. I mean, it is the one thing in my head that, like, you know, on any front, that I think, I really wish that we had balanced the growth and the profitability um, better because I think with profitability you get options. You know, so um, it's easy to go out and it's not easy, but you know, raise money when you have a business that's thriving. Um, it's a lot harder to take that business and make it profitable. And as my husband says, it's not really a business until it's making money. <laughs> <laughs> so what levers would you have put in to, to make it more profitable? Yeah. Um, I, think it, it, the, I think the growth is really the big thing. I mean, growth is so important, and I would have done everything to grow the business. I just don't know that like it had to grow at, like I said, triple digits. You know, if it had grown at double digits and broken even, that would have been, like I think, a better scenario. Are you glad you took VC funding? Uh, was that a good thing, or do you wish that you would? Um, and, and I don't. I certainly yeah. don't have an opinion here, so I'm just curious. You know, do you wish you had had that big influx of, of money, or do you wish you had maybe used some other way to bring in cash, like taking out loans or investing yeah, more of your I think, own money? I think it was it was um, it was good, and I I think I wish we didn't raise as much money as we raised. Um, I think you know raising the money was I think was fine. I think that uh, I just would have used the money differently, you know, and thought about how to extend, you know, having that money and how to, you know, not have to go out and raise money five times, that's, which is what we ended up doing. So why would you have not have raised as much money? Well, I think by raising, I think there's a couple of things. I think when you have that much money in the bank, there's this false sense of security within the organization that it's it's really, I just think it's human nature. I think it's really hard to be uh, fiscally responsible, you know? And I, it's not because anyone's bad or doing anything wrong. You just should I, be hungry. Exactly, I think being a little hungry is, is a good thing. I know how we felt, and obviously it was the extreme when we bootstrapped the business, but I think that, you know, having, and there's lots of different theories about this. I mean, I know people that say you should t take all the money you can and have it sitting in the bank, but I just think it does something, uh, it just makes it hard to get to that, that that bottom line number. Um, yeah, so I, you know. <laughs> so would you do it again? And, and, I think the other, and I think the other thing is, sorry, is that yeah. as you start to raise money and you're successful, you know, there are these valuations which maybe for a moment in time feel really good. You know, you think, whoa, wow, you know, that, that's, that's an amazing number. Our company is worth that. But that's really just the beginning. Then all the hard work starts, you know, because at the end of the day you get big and 
big, eva big valuations, perhaps are inflated, and then I think your options become you know, fewer and fewer because there's less and less people out there that maybe can afford uh, you know, your company if there's like, an acquisition or something like that. So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, I think, the big valuations. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's a vanity metric, right, that, that sort of is very exciting. It's exciting. But it ends up causing some interesting it, it problems. It's a little bit of pit in your stomach. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're like, what? Wow, we got that? That's amazing. You know? <laughs> so what do you wish you had learned when you were mm -hmm. in school that would have inoculated you uh, against some of the things that happened? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, I think it's probably good I didn't know certain things because I'm not sure there would be a one king's loan. I mean, if people afterwards say, how did you do that? I'm like, I don't know. It's crazy how we did it. Like, we were running around like crazy people, but we got it done. We built a beautiful brand. We executed really well. We delivered a great experience. Um, I think that, you know, I think I just wish I had a, probably a better understanding of sort of the whole venture community and fundraising and valuations and, you know, different scenarios and things like that. I mean, obviously, I knew I had read about that. I studied that. But to really sort of, you know, understand better, like, the different sort of options that were out there. And I think, you know, it's easy to sit here and say that we were running like crazy people. You know, it's like you hardly had a second to even stop to have a conversation with somebody. So when you're in the, the thick of it and, you know, you're just trying to get the next sale up for the next day. It's, you know, it sounds really simple to say, oh, I wish I knew more and taken more time to understand that. But, you know, we, we were doing the best that we, we possibly could given, you know, the resources that we had. Great. I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. Who has a burning question? Yes, Matt. Hey, thanks, Bo. Hey, Susan, thanks so much for coming. Sure. Um, I've been wondering, so, you know, most entrepreneurs in the Valley typically start out around like age 30 or 35 when they're starting a company. Yeah. Both you and Ali were a little bit older than that. Yeah. How do you think that affected your experience like dealing with VCs, starting the company in general? So I'm going to repeat the question, okay. make sure everyone heard it. Uh, you, a lot of people think of uh, entrepreneurs in the Valley starting their company when they're relatively young, yeah. you know, late 20s, early 30s, and uh, you and your partner were, were older than that. Yeah. Uh, how did that affect your experience? Well, Ali actually was in that demographic, so I, just, I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. I, I, on the other hand, not. I mean, you know, I was at a point in my career where I could have probably been retiring instead of starting a, a new business. Um, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, it actually was very valuable because I had, you know, had a whole entire career behind me doing this. So. I, I think I had a lot of understanding about, you know, building teams and, you know, how important people were and um, negotiating for certain things. Uh, so I, th I think it was actually very valuable. Uh, it's probably not what you, you know, I'm not your typical entrepreneur for sure. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, the, the work experience that I had and actually that Allie had had, even though she, you know, Allie's 20 years my junior. So, uh it was really helpful in, you know, getting the business started. Great. Yes. Hi, thank you again for coming. So I was wondering what it was like working with people who were direct competitors. So you're bringing in these different uh, manufacturers of furniture or different items. And did, do you think that helped your business or do you think it was a difficult thing? Like, oh, I'm, I'm working with Pepsi and Coca-Cola. How do, do they expect me to have a loyalty to them, or do they know that I'm going to be working with different brands? Oh, so let's, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I think, I think if I get this right, the question is, how is it working with competing brands within categories? Is that really what the question is? Um, I think it was actually good. It was good. It was actually, One King's Lane was, and I hear this all the time when I go to, you know, to trade shows, it was really, it was an amazing thing for the entire home furnishings industry because what we did was we really, you know, we did disrupt the industry and we gave people access to this merchandise. And so we did an amazing job of presenting everybody's brand. So, you know, if it was a, a sofa manufacturer here, A and B, we did just as good a job for both of them. It kind of helped the entire industry uh, because of the way that I think we went about, you know, presenting and marketing the, the category overall. 
Did these companies find that this helped them yes. boost business yes, outside much. of these deals? Like, oh, oh yeah, who totally. knew this company made this lovely? Yeah, we would see. Actually, it was kind of amazing just talking about metrics, but uh, we would hear time and time again from our manufacturers that if they were on one King's Lane, they would see, once they had their own websites, because like I said at the beginning, they didn't, but they would see like a 500% lift to traffic on their website after they were on one King's Lane. So this was actually became part of our pitch to getting people to work with us that, you know, we would they would come on One King's Lane, we would do a great job of presenting their brand and telling people who they were, um, and they would in turn end up seeing a lift to their, their business. So it, it actually sort of helped everybody. And we, we also, we we pretty good editors, so you know, I think I could say that what you would, you'd be in good company. Okay. Yeah. Back there? Um, how did you come to trust your partner that you've never seen? Yes. You've never seen her, you don't know her at all, but yeah. somehow you trust her and she becomes your partner. So the question was, how did you trust this partner who you really didn't know very well? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was like one of those moments where that was a very big leap of faith that, that I took and, you know, tried to put also in place the proper legal documents so that if it didn't work out that, you know, we would be able to do something about it, to be honest. So, but... Uh, you know, I think just spending time with Allie, we just sometimes, you know, you meet somebody and you connect with them. Like we just, we spent a lot of time together in the, you know, in the six weeks, which was short, but it just felt like on so many different levels we connected and that, that seemed to work. I, you know, my, my joke, I think I told you on the phone is that I've had two really great blind dates in my life. One was my husband and the other one was Allie Pincus. <laughs> <laughs> great. Super, you could become a matchmaker. Exactly. No, great. Exactly. Yeah. Do you see an advantage in starting a company with a person that you know for six weeks as with, for example, a lifelong friend? Do you want to repeat that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the question is, do you see an advantage of starting a company with somebody that you only know for six weeks versus somebody that you've known for a very long time? I think there are actually some advantages because there's no preconceived uh, <coughs> notions, you know, and... It, it was actually interesting. We had a lot of different things happen. Like, I remember this, you know, we, what we ended up finding out also is that we complemented each other really well. And so just thinking about our customer and our target customer, we really sort of were the bookends of who we were going after. So that was good. And I maybe came to the table, say, from my work experience with preconceived ideas, but Allie didn't, you know. And so she didn't know anything. It's like, I would say... It'd be great if we could call on this vendor, but oh, they're never going to take our phone call. Allie goes, "Of course they will. I'll call them." You know, and she'd pick up the phone, and and call them. So, I think not having all that history in a way was kind of good. I mean, we certainly built history together over you know the last eight years. But maybe that was, you know I hadn't really thought about it that way. But I think there probably was some advantage to that. You you came up with a fifty fifty split. When you ended up with differences of opinion, you know, what happened? You know, did you just sort of arm wrestle to figure out who got yeah, their way? a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> In the beginning, there were, there were a lot of conversations because we kind of, big decisions we made together. And so sometimes it got uncomfortable. But I think at the end of the day, that's kind of what happens in partnerships and you ultimately end up with the better outcome you know you, you have a conversation it might get a little feisty but at the end of the day you agree upon what it is and you know you make a decision and move forward we also I have to say that we did spend a lot of time on the brand before we started and so you know when you start a business there's like a million decisions that you have to make as you're putting the business together and you start scaling especially business that takes off very quickly so that time that we invested in the brand paid off big time because as we were moving very quickly, we were able to say, well, we might like that, but it doesn't feel on brand, so no, we're not going to do that. You know, and we were able to make those decisions much faster. So that, that was time very well spent in the beginning. Great. Shivani. How did you guys come up with the name One King's Lane? <laughs> so how did you come up with the name One yeah. King's Lane? Um, well, actually, it's interesting. We... Um, we wanted, we knew we wanted to be an address, so that was, you know, we, I had had a, because I felt that it was a, it was a, it was a home site, okay. and so we wanted to be a home, we wanted it to, you know, sort of conjure in somebody's mind this, I mean, it would be different in yours and mine and yours, but 
you know, a place that you thought seemed sort of cool. Um, we felt like, you know, you think about streets or tree-lined streets, usually those houses have lower digit numbers. You know, you don't see like 1892, one, you know, King's Lane, right? So that, that's what we sort of got down to that point. We got down to one. <laughs> we got, got down to one. Why not one if you're going to pick a number? Um, and we really wanted it to feel like it had history to the name, but that it was, you know, cool and modern. And this is actually a funny story, but three weeks after we launched, I met a woman and oh, she said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm a co-founder of One King's Lane. She said, oh, I love One King's Lane. I said, oh my God, you know One King's Lane? That's awesome. She goes, I've been shopping on it for years, you know? And I was like, mm, I don't think so. And she goes, no, no, I've been shopping on One King's Lane for, you know, like the last couple of years. So I finally said, yes, of course you have. But it, like, it, made, it was such a good validation of the name because she felt like, you know. She'd already been there. It, she'd already been there. And yes, he's very old. and right. right. So exactly. King, two women starting a company with the name Kings. Why wasn't it Queens? I don't know. We like, we like <laughs> Kings. Oh, and I'll tell you another funny story about the name is that, we, we loved it, One King's Lane, and um, Allie was friendly with a very successful entrepreneur in the Valley. So she said, you know what, I'm going to ask him what he thinks. And so I said, great, that's amazing, you have access to him, ask him. That is the worst name I have ever heard in my life, you know, it's like you should make, it was a time when people were like making up names, yeah, yeah. you know, with letters. Terrible. Take all the vowels out. Yeah, take all the, do something. It's terrible. But that was actually, you know, we didn't really get around to talking to this about, you know, I think founder's intuition. I mean, here's a guy that's hugely successful, says, terrible name. Here we are. We're the customer. You know, we're the founders. We loved it. And we're like, okay, we're going with One King's Lane. Like, we, we believe in it. We love it. We can say it. People understand what it is. We think it's a good thing. We're going with it. Great. So. Yes. Uh, could you tell a little bit more about that first bootstrapping phase? So from the moment you say, okay, we want to do this, yeah. to the launch, when I'm sure you brought a lot to the table that you do on your own, but on the other hand, there are yeah. things you cannot do on your own. Yeah, so no, how did you get to the point to launch the page? It's a great question. The question is, talk about the from bootstrapping to launch, like what that was like. And it's a great question. So what we actually did and the reason that we were able to do it, and by the way, we did that in five and a half months. So, you know, we had had advice from somebody who had done this before. They're like, first to market, move as fast as you can. And we're like, okay, how can we, what is the fastest way we can do this? So we actually outsourced everything. And this is also part of our neuroses that if it didn't work, we could walk away too. So like if we didn't own anything. So we went and found a team that basically built the website. They did fulfillment for us, and they, um, yeah, they did that. Then we found a creative team that was in New York that did all of our creative. So everything like that, we pretty much had outsourced. And then once we took funding, then we started bringing that back in-house. Like I talked about, we built a really world-class creative team. So that was after you know uh, two years in business. We said, okay, we're not going to do this anymore. We need, this needs to be internally, and we need to own this. And same thing with uh, the you know tech team and every everything that we had outsourced. But yeah, that was that was the only way that we we could do it for sure. Yeah. How did you come up with the idea for One King's Lane, and how did you decide to pursue that idea? Um, well. How did I come up with the the idea for One King's Land, and how did I decide to per, or how to pursue it? Um, I mean, basically, like I said, it was something that I was looking for that didn't exist, um, and I felt like there was a big opportunity online because everything out there was pretty much, uh, you know, what I would call e-commerce 1.0 at that point. It was like you knew what you wanted, you typed it in, you went to it, you found it. There was really no curation. There was, you know, no shopping around. There, it was, there was nothing enjoyable about it. It was more, you know, a function. Like, I need that. I'm going to go buy that. Um, and really, being in the apparel industry and being exposed to the flash sale model was really how I brought the, those two things together because I was working for a manufacturer at the time uh, when flash sales first came out, and we did a sale with them and sold. I was a t-shirt company. We sold like 1,600 t-shirts in 24 hours, and I'm like, there's something to this model, you know, and it was actually new, and there hadn't been any new channels of distribution in the apparel industry for many years until the flash sale came around. So it was really putting those two, you know, the idea like there's there's an opportunity here, there's a white space. 
how am I going to do that with the flash sale, putting those two together? Being in the apparel industry for so long and then going into home furnishings, yeah. did you see some interesting differences between those, the way people shop or the oh, type yeah. of people who shop or yeah, I mean, anything else? Um, I, you know, th there definitely were differences, but there were so many similarities. Mm -hmm. It was actually funny because, you know, everybody takes great pride in whatever their industry is. So, um, you know, when we first went into the market, people were like, do you have home experience? Did you, do you come from like a home? Man? And we're like, no, 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 no. And they're like, well, how could you possibly do this? You know, but I mean, there's so many similarities, I think, in merchandising that whether it's, you know, apparel or home, that that's pretty easy. I think, you know, their logistics, like shipping a couch is a lot different than, than shipping a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, selling a couch is a little bit different than a t-shirt. You know, it's a much more considered purchase. So as a company scaled and we got into more categories, we started to, you know, see differences that way. But, you know, at the end of the day, good product is good product and people gravitate to it, you know. And that was really, you know, we worked really hard to deliver awesome product to the consumer. Great. Way back in the back. Um, do you think that the, the flash sale model became maybe less relevant or successful with time as, as the economy sort of got better? Uh, yeah, the question is, the flash sale model become less relevant as the economy improved? Um, I think it definitely impacted that model. Um, you know, when we started, you know, starting a business in the height of the recession is scary. Um, but I, there's for sure always opportunities during a recession. And our vendors had inventory, you know, out the wazoo that they never had experienced that before and didn't know what to do with it. So that definitely helped us get started. As they started cleaning up their inventory, it became, you know, definitely harder to get good inventory. But I think what was good for us is that at that time, we also started hearing from our consumer that they wanted us to be a more reliable destination, meaning they wanted to be able to show up when they, when they wanted to and find white sheets as opposed to in the you know previous iteration of One King's Land, they'd have to wait to the day that we had a white sheet sale, right? They couldn't just show up and, and find the white sheets on the site. So we felt in an effort to deliver a better experience uh, to the consumer that we could still offer value. I mean, value comes in a lot of different forms. Uh, price is one of them, but that we could, you know, by having a really great assortment that was readily available every day was, you know, really, more uh, appealing to our customer. So I'm curious, when you did these flash sales, yeah. what sort of volume did you have for these? Was it five, fifty, five hundred, five thousand? You know, oh, how many of yeah, them? how many you know uh, were I think available I of think an item? The oh, of an item, it depended. Yeah. I mean, we we have a huge vintage business also, which is all one of a kind. Ah. So uh, you, and you would never know, but yeah. But the flash sale was also, I mean, it's an interesting model. It's like literally every, imagine that you're a shopkeeper. Every day you change what your store looks like. It's pretty insane. Yeah. Wow. It's like being in the newspaper business, yeah, yeah, yeah. but more intense. Yeah. Cool. Yes. I was wondering, uh, how did you pick the products that you put into your portfolio and how did you choose on them quickly? Yeah. Um, the question is, how do we pick what the product that we put in on the site, I guess, right? You're asking. Yeah. No testing. We, we, just, we just went right at it. Um, you know, I think that, that we laugh within our company, but I am kind of the original customer. I started that off, you know, when we started in the beginning, saying that I moved to L.A., I bought a house, I became obsessed with decorating and entertaining. And so I, I am number one customer, you know. It's like, and so it's pretty, not easy, but in the beginning to know, like, this is going to resonate with our customer and, and this won't. And and we would do that. You know, we would say, I'm sorry that we're not going to sell this to the manufacturers if we didn't feel that it was the right product because it would be, it would dilute our brand. You know? I'm assuming that today you can use a lot of analytics. Oh, yeah, today. So, there's so in do the you beginning. do that? I mean, yeah. I'm going to guess that you do some sort of oh, totally, you know, yeah. machine learning. You're like, okay, blue pillows sell, green pillows don't. Yeah, that we, we totally know. Although it's interesting because we, we have all that information but we also, it's important to have a certain amount of an assortment and choice. So sometimes we actually, if something is 
you know, people look at it a lot. Uh, well, that's not a good example, but sometimes we'll put things on there that aren't bestsellers because we feel like they add something to the, the cachet of the assortment. Not a lot, but we will do right. that. Even if yeah. people don't buy it, at least it's interesting it's enough interesting. to show. It's interesting, yeah. I mean, we'll tell people, vendors, like if you, you know, put in an assortment together that, well, I have this one item, it's really expensive. Okay, put, if we like it, we'll say put it in because you know, it only takes one person to buy it and it makes it a little more interesting. Cool. Yeah. Yes, back here. Um, I was wondering, because you opened your business during the recession in 2008, how did you even get the idea to think, oh, that's a great time to open a business? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, so how did you think it was a good time to open a business during the middle of a recession? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, there's lots of data to show that great businesses get started during a downturn. You know, I think when you have an idea as a founder and you're really passionate about it and you believe this is there is an opportunity there, you just put, like, blinders on and, you know, you go for it. And, I mean, obviously, we didn't even try to raise money, so we were aware that there was a, this huge recession going on. Um, but... I, I don't. It's, well, let me it's, ask you a question. It's actually, it's a really good question, but I just think we were so driven and so passionate about what we were doing that we just sort of blocked blocked that out. But but let me ask you though. Oftentimes, right, rents are cheaper. You can yeah. pay less for people. Oh, totally. I Everything. mean, there are lots of things that that are that are really positive aspects oh, yeah. of starting during totally, a recession. Totally. Did you find that? Totally. I mean, we we found that on all fronts. I mean, you know. Uh, the people that built our website, you know, we were able to negotiate a much, like our, our deal in the beginning, we negotiated a contract where we gave them a deposit. It was a $10,000 deposit on the website. And then whatever the, the additional cost was, they gave us 18 months interest free to pay it off. And, 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 and not only that, they told us they would just take, because they were doing our fulfillment, um, that it would, they just take 1% of our revenue every month. And it, we got to the end of the 18 months, we hadn't paid it off, then we'd, you'd have to write them a check. But we, we ended up paying them off in five months or six months. So it, it was, but I mean, you never, I don't think we could ever negotiate a deal like that today. So yeah, that's actually a great point. What's going through your head when you see when people see that you have this very successful model and they try to copy your model? So did you have people trying to copy your model? Yeah. Um, well, it's it's interesting. We were first to market, so that the, you know first mover huge advantage. So that was great. Um, and some of the other flash sale sites that were uh, in apparel, they then got into home after they saw our success, but. We kind of owned home, and we made, you know, it, it was, that was kind of our pitch also. We're all about home. We're not doing apparel. We're not doing all these other categories. So we were very focused, and I think that helped. Um, I would say, I don't know how many years into it, there was a competitor that came that basically copied everything that we did, and that was sort of annoying. But one of the things we took... <laughs> we take a lot of pride on is that we we were big in iterating and innovating so we are constantly moving the business forward so the business that started in March 2009 by even six months later had different you know pieces to it it had uh, designer sales so we called them tastemaker tag sales and then we brought in a vintage marketplace so we are always changing and making it interesting um, and when you copy somebody, it's hard to do that. You know, like you have to wait to see what the uh, the person you're copying does before you do it. And so I think it makes it, it it's, it's harder for the person copying. But um, it's annoying. But it, it did happen. It happened actually all over the world, too. There were international sites that looked very much like One King's Line. Great. Question back there. Uh, yes, how did you deal with, uh, like, supply chain issues and... When a product was really popular and sold out really quickly, did that, was that a real challenge? Or? Yeah, it, the question was, so how do we deal with supply chain issues, and was it a problem when things sold out really quickly? I mean, this was kind of the nature of the beast of flash sales. That was, you know, you didn't know how many pieces were there, and so the, things would sell out really quickly. And we had to find this, like, almost balance between frustrating the customer so much that she's like, I'm out of here, I'm not coming back. Like nothing's ever available to having enough that it looked like things were selling through, especially when it was a flash sale model. Like the best thing to happen was everything sell out because then, you know, it was a successful sale. But it was, 
it was finding that balance so that people felt at least they had the opportunity to get in and shop. Um, but to create some urgency. Yeah, you wanted the urgency, but you didn't want it to sell out so fast that they're just like, ugh, I give up. I can't, you know, I can't ever get what I want here. So just making sure that we had enough of an assortment. And, you know, as we got smarter and had information, we would, you know, be able to say to a vendor based on their, you know, they're selling before, oh, if you can't give us X amount of pieces, we don't want that item because it's going to, you know, sell out too fast. Okay, so tell us, <laughs> what's next for you? Would you do this again? Do you plan on doing this again? Uh, you told me today that you had lunch with a couple of your past venture capital yeah. <laughs> investors. So are you getting ready to pitch them on something else? Uh, I don't know about pitching them. Um, yeah, I think I have another something in me. You know, I, I have to say this is the most fun I've ever had, you know, in my life doing this. It was, uh, it's been incredible. And uh, I, I think I have another one. Would in it me. be in the same? I no. mean, you don't have to tell us all no. your secrets, but is what what interest? Well, let's based on your experience. What industries are do you think are most interesting? I mean, for the folks in the audience who are looking at and, and who are listening online, you know, what are the things you think are ripe for innovation? Yeah, um, I don't know if it's a certain industry or not. I, I I like to look at it more by demographics. So that that you know, I, I think that there has. This is what I'll say. There's been a lot of focus on millennials, which is very interesting, but I think there's a lot of other interesting demographics out there that have been uh, underserved. And Great. I think those, the, that, that makes for interesting. Well, that gives us something. <laughs> <laughs> we have the older folks in the room who are exactly. chiming in. I didn't say older, but, well, you know. <laughs> I, well, I'm delighted. I can't wait to see what you end up doing next. And we are on your side cheering Thank for you. you. Thank, Thank you so you. much for Thank your you. insights.